Thanks to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Bu kadar. Artık sana baharat yok Avrupa. Oh, Portugal. Are you all right? Welcome to Portugal, one of the historically most influential countries on earth that almost always gets overshadowed by its neighbors and somehow everyone seems to forget and dismiss it as just little Spain. It is located in southern Europe on the Iberian Peninsula, bordered exclusively by Spain. In the Atlantic, the country also controls two archipelagos, Madeira and the Azores. Despite its on first glance mediocre size, much like a decent sized penis, Portugal is big where it matters as the country has the third largest maritime zone for special rights and resource exploitation, also known as an EEZ, in the world. The nation is divided into seven regions, those being the North, Center, Lisbon, Alentejo, Algarve, Madeira and Azores region. The capital and largest city of the country is Lisbon with around 2.3 million inhabitants, while the country as a whole has around 10.3 million. Although the country is small, Portugal's history well overcompensates its border's size, as the country is one of the oldest continuously existing nations in Europe, and arguably in the world, founded all the way back in the 12th century. Ever since then, the country had a crucial role to play in Moorish swimming lessons, also known as the Reconquista, as well as the exploration of the New World and interracial sexual fantasies, aka the founding of Brazil. Sopa, sopa de macacos. Sopa de macacos. Other than that, the country was a pioneer when it came to maritime trade and exploration, as it launched Europe into the age of exploration by establishing trade routes and outposts across Africa, India, Southeast Asia and even Japan. But to really get to know the country's history and culture, there is no better way to do so than to go and check out Lisbon itself. And to fully immerse ourselves within the country, there is no better way than to switch our digital location to Portugal using NordVPN. As a frequent traveler, one of the biggest risks of my travels, other than the Kosovar Mafia taking my kidneys and selling them for 5 euros in the KitKat bar on the black market, is having a secure internet connection. Constantly having to use public Wi-Fi at cafes and random hostels puts me at risk from having my data and password stolen. But Thankfully, that problem is solved through NordVPN, as NordVPN encrypts and secures my traffic via Wi-Fi, blocks any malware-ridden websites, and skips those annoying ads saying there are hot singles in my area, but whenever I go to them, it's just the Kosovo Mafia trying to take my kidney. With NordVPN you can watch your favorite TV shows anywhere in the world by simply changing your location to more than 5600 servers in 59 countries with a simple press of a button. Alongside that you can check if airlines provide different prices depending on your location. Pro tip, they do. So because of all that, go and click the link in the description and go to nordvpn.com slash ironically to get an enormous discount off the 2 year plan right now. And alongside that great deal, you also get 4 additional months completely free. Also Nord provides a 30 day money back guarantee, so if you don't like using Nord, no worries, you'll get every last cent back. So go and check it out and support my channel. Lying on the northern bank of the Tagus river, Lisbon is Europe's second oldest capital after Athens, founded in 12th century BC by Phoenicians. Upon Rome's triumph in the Punic Wars, the city fell under control of the empire and was bestowed the name of Alisipo. Since then, throughout the centuries, the city has grown into a city of global importance, becoming the center of trade, arts, education and fat middle-aged British tourists. However, the city is characterized most by the buildings that exude up its hills rising from the banks of the Tagus River, donning a plethora of architectural styles ranging from Gothic and Baroque all the way to its indigenous of Moneline and Pombaline, forming tight alleyways and streets that invite one to explore and find out what lies behind the corner. To start off our journey, we enter Lisbon through its heart, the Commerce Square. The Commerce Square is the city's main square, located right on the Tagus River. The square was built in the mid 18th century on the grounds where the royal palace stood, but due to a Harlem shake caused by tectonic plates, the palace was leveled to the ground, much like my self worth, after waking up next to a snoring fat chick. After the square's construction, it served as a port to hundreds of ships going to and from the city. Countless merchants roaming the plaza, exchanging reals and peddling goods from faraway lands. 
In the middle of the square stands the equestrian statue of King Jose I. The monument was placed here in the 18th century for the king's birthday as a thank you for his restoration efforts after the great earthquake. The unveiling of the statue was also a significant event in Portugal's history as it was considered the first work of public art in the country that wasn't a Roman doodle of a stiffy, and from then on inspiring more artistic endeavors within the kingdom. On the northern end of the square stands the defining symbol of the square, the Arc of Rua Augusta. Much like the previously mentioned statue of Jose I, the arch was sprung up to commemorate the earthquake that shook Lisbon to its knees, and symbolizes Portugal's rebirth. On the arch several historical Portuguese figures are depicted, alongside a text in Latin that reads the virtues of the greatest. Beyond the arch of Rua Augusta lies the adequately named Rua Augusta, aka the Street of Augusta, known as Lisbon's main pedestrian zone, filled with cafes, restaurants, and souvenir shops. Basically your bread and butter of any European city and white girl's Instagram page. Continuing north you will reach the Dom Pedro Fort Square, also proclaimed as the true main square of Lisbon, and not that stinky touristy commerce square. Many consider it as the true main square of the city due to it being a major transportation hub due to several bus lines and trains passing through here alongside it being the center of civil events such as protests and street performances. A bit west of Dom Pedro Square lies one of Lisbon's most famous neighborhoods, Bairro Alto. Characterized by inclined streets and cute three-story buildings with lovely terraces popping out of them, Bairro Alto is one of the oldest parts of the town that began construction in the late 15th century. Many of the houses here boast an iconic Pombaline style which is endemic to their country and is identified as a Portuguese twist on neoclassical buildings built along a grid. Alongside them you can find romanticism and French influences, which makes strolling through the streets of the neighborhood highly enjoyable. Throughout Bairro Alto and much of Lisbon in general you can find several iconic funiculars going up and down the slopes of the capital. The oldest of the bunch was put to use in the late 19th century. But if you ask me, you're way better off walking as most of these are used by tourists and cost between 1 euro 50 and 2 euros and 90 cents to basically go up and down a single street. And it's not as if most of the Brits visiting are meeting their daily step goals anyways. Moving on from Bairro Alto, we head on back east into Lisbon where we can find several of the city's most iconic churches. The first on our list being the St. Anthony's Church. Built in the 18th century, the church was built in the honor of St. Anthony, right where he spawned in Lisbon. During his time on this earth, the saint was known as a matchmaker and protector of young brides, because of which, in June, the church organizes mass marriages known as St. Anthony's Weddings, where numerous young couples come here to get married. Too bad 59% of Portugal's marriages end in divorce, but hey, like my girlfriend and I's sex life, quantity over quality, am I right? <laughs> uh... A couple of meters further up from St. Anthony's Church lies the historic Lisbon Cathedral, also known colloquially as Sé de Lisboa. Built in the 12th century, the church was an iconic staple in Lisbon's history as it came into existence upon the successes of the Reconquista, when Iberian crusaders reenacted the events that would transpire in the Balkans nine centuries later, and kicked out Moors from the region. <laughs> As a way of celebrating this achievement, the Portuguese conquerors tore down a mosque and built this behemoth in its place. Over the centuries, the cathedral saw many important baptisms of the Portuguese nobility and clergy, and even the baptism of the aforementioned Saint Anthony. During the Great Earthquake of Lisbon, the cathedral hosted a celebration for the Feast of All Saints, during which the roof collapsed and squashed hundreds of worshippers inside the cathedral. North of the cathedral, on top of Lisbon's tallest hill overlooking the city, stands the mighty Saint George's Castle. The castle dates back to the 1st century BC when the Romans laid down the first stones of the fortress. After the fall of the Roman Empire, the fortification was taken over by the Visigoths and later on the Moors. The fort came into Portuguese hands in the 12th century when King Afonso besieged the city from the Moors. After that, the building became the place of royal Portuguese residence. The castle gained its modern name, St. George, after the Anglo-Portuguese Treaty which started the longest alliance in history between Portugal and England, signed in 1373, because of which the Portuguese rulers named the fortress in the honor of England's patron saint. The fortress is also notable 
notable due to the fact that after the famous explorer Vasco da Gama completed his voyage to India, he was welcomed by the king at this very structure. Today the structure serves as a museum depicting archaeological findings found within its walls and the area from throughout the centuries alongside the medieval fortress itself. Further east of St. George's Castle is Lisbon's oldest and arguably prettiest district, the Alfama district. The neighborhood is easily recognizable with its cobblestone roads and traditional houses spring up the steep hills that go down to the Tagus. Historically, Alfama was populated by Lisbon's lower class citizens such as sailors and dock workers and had a reputation as Lisbon's Bronx. But today the district became a center point of fashion and artisanship in the city, making it the perfect place to stroll through with your loved one or indulge in wine due to a lack of one. Within the district you can also find a national pantheon where many of Portugal's most important personalities were laid to rest, such as presidents, poets and many explorers. Originally, the building was built in the late 17th century, in the Baroque style as the Church of St. Ingratia. However, construction started way earlier. The church was to be built on the grounds of a smaller church that was desecrated during a robbery, the crime for which a Jew was blamed and executed for. <laughs> as if there isn't enough to blame on them already. Later on, the poor man was exonerated and proven innocent. But for his last words, he stated that the construction of the church will take forever due to the killing of an innocent man. On the opposite end of the city, you can find the Geronimo's Monastery. Built in the early 16th century, the monastery is a monument to the Age of Discovery as King Manuel I found on the site of a hermitage where Vasco da Gama and his crew spent their last night before departing for his voyage to India. Alongside that, the monastery also gives thanks to the Virgin Mary for the success of the voyage. After its construction, da Gama's tomb was placed inside alongside the tomb of poet Louis de Camoes responsible for the epic of Lusiades, in which he retells the story of da Gama and his compatriots. Alongside them, several Portuguese kings were also laid to rest here, such as King Manuel and King Sebastião. Another thing that makes Geronimo's monastery notable is its architectural design. The building is a prime example of Portuguese Manueline style indigenous to the country. The style resembles Gothic with intricate sculptures and details depicting maritime motifs. It became most popular during the Age of Discovery, as it was used to celebrate the discoveries of that age and Portugal's maritime prowess. South of the monastery, you can find yet another monument to Portugal's explorers, the Monument of Discoveries. Unlike most of the previously mentioned buildings in this video, the Monument of Discoveries was constructed in the mid-20th century as a piece for the 1940s Portuguese World Exhibition. On the forehand, Henry the Navigator is depicted, followed by 32 other navigators. Cartographers, warriors, colonizers, missionaries, chroniclers, and artists. The inscription above the anchor reads, Dedication to Henry the Navigator. All in all, the monument is 56 meters tall and an important symbol for modern day Lisbon. Not too far off west lies arguably Portugal's most iconic building, the Belém Tower. The tower was constructed in the 16th century, once more in the famous Manuline style of architecture. The tower was originally constructed as a fort, but often was used by King Manuel to host banquets and state meals. During the Age of Discovery, the Portuguese ran into a variety of new animals across the world. Thus, the fort was used as sort of an arena to determine which of the animals was the mightiest. The famous event of doing so was when the people tried to figure out which animal from Africa and Asia were the strongest. So they set up the fight between an Asian elephant and an African rhinoceros. Instead of the two beasts fighting it out to the death, the elephant ended up running away from the rhino. Thus, a statue of the rhino was engraved into the tower to commemorate its victory. When talking about Portugal, it is impossible to mention the country without mentioning the intricate Portuguese tiles found around the cities. Originally introduced by the Arab invaders in the 13th century, the tiles became a staple in Portuguese architecture and artisanry. Most were done in the white and blue colors due to a variety of factors, mainly the two colors that were considered fashionable between the 15th and 18th centuries, alongside with the color blue being seen as the color of power and wealth. Back in the day, only Portugal's most wealthy could afford tiles with their buildings. However, as Portugal got more wealthy, they started popping onto more and more buildings. When the Bible was only afforded by the rich, many churches used tiles to depict biblical stories as a way to communicate to the masses. And yeah, that would be Lisbon. A city defined by growing, then showing. Its statue is a former world power. 
is a place defined by the sea and maritime exploration, which is deeply engraved in the buildings and the stories they tell. Alongside their love for canned fish and pawning their children for salted cod, is a place that somehow goes under the radar of most travelers as they head instead to Spain and Italy. Yet I still implore you to go and take a look at the country found standing at the end of the old world. And once more, thanks to all channel members who continue supporting this channel. If you wish to support the channel and help me make more videos, consider becoming a channel member like these lovely people, Craig Zeeves, Mickey D, Pavan, Anthony Newtube, Roland S, Emmanuel Donchilla, Andre Sorin Parskiv, Poodle Ross, Ramberlad, Jozef Borat, PC Chan, Seal King, Vangelis Gru, Adam Cube, Mate Radu, Raj, Exalted TD45, Berker1237, Kaza Mears, Engine Seer Sivius, Andy the Salad God, Von KL47, Alexander Gibra, Kyle Wilcox, and Alfredo Jimenez. My name is Janos, and you've watched Living Ironically in Europe. Hey, hey, why